everyone, how are you today? I hope you're having a really good day so far. If you're new here, my name is Taylor. I live in Baltimore, Maryland, and on my YouTube channel, I feature content that's generally focused on knitting and spinning. In this video, I have quite a few, maybe just a couple exciting things to share with you. The first is my finished Vare Pullover by Gudrun Johnston. This is a pattern that she published in her book three of the Shetland Trader. It is titled Heritage. And this sweater I knit using entirely Jameson and Smith's two ply jumper weight wool. Uh, Jameson and Smith is one of my favorite yarns. It is a yarn that is woolen spun so it's very warm it has a bit of toothiness to it the stitches really hold themselves together i uh worked this pattern from the bottom up and then the pattern has you cast on a few steak stitches for the armholes so you can continue to work the front and the back with color work in the round which I love and you also cast on a third steak for the neck so that you're working neck shaping to this color work design uh, so that the neck and I'm just exaggerating it for you here but the neck at the front sits lower than the neck at the sides and along the back so it fits comfortably it does sit high on the neck um, you know just above like those neck bones um, but yeah, it sits high on the neck, still super comfortable. And I didn't modify this pattern too much, except that, and now that Star Baby's on my lap, you can barely see it, but there's a short little area between working the lace motif and beginning the color work, where I think in pattern you knit just a few rows and I added just a few more uh, because I have a very small bust and I noticed in the samples that were knit and in the photography of the design, in a lot of other models, the lace kind of sits on the bust somewhat. And I thought I have just small enough of a bust that I can squeeze mine in just above the lace so that it looks a little bit more like an empire moment, you know, so that the lace starts just beneath the bust. So I added just a few rows of stockinette plain to kind of give me that little extra bit of room so that, so that my bust is above the lace. So that's the first slight modification. The second is in the sleeves. I did choose the balloon sleeve option for this design. And I actually haven't blocked this sweater yet. I was too excited. I don't know. I didn't wash it in time for the podcast and, and, I, and I haven't like formally blocked my sweater. I did steam block it several times in the process of making it. Like when I'm cutting my steaks, I immediately steam block them folded in place and I steam blocked the lace as I worked the lace. I pretty much steam blocked the entire thing as I went, except for the sleeves. I feel like I do smell like a machine <laughs> right now because there's still the machine grease on this coned yarn. And I have to pull the sleeve down for you here because when my arms are bent, the sleeves sit at like a bracelet length, which I really like because I feel like I can still layer jewelry with this garment if I wish to. Um, but when my arms are down at my sides and my arms are straight, I feel like the balloon sleeve fits perfect. And when I was working the pattern, I finished the first sleeve with all of the increases mentioned in the design. My sleeve was already a little bit longer than the pattern specified it should have measured out to, so I felt comfortable ripping back and then I decided I wanted to actually rip back a little bit extra to remove some of the increases so that my balloon sleeve wouldn't be quite as large. I ripped back maybe like 35 rows to get to the point where I was like, you know what, I'm just going to stop increasing here for a while. And I think I knit like three to five inches just straight without any increases just to minimize the, the width of the balloon. So it's still dramatic, but not not the most dramatic. Like I didn't want it to be so big that it would start to kind of fold over the ribbing and be like this shape. I kind of wanted to avoid that. I just felt like it wasn't necessary. I feel like this is dramatic enough for me. 
I also really wanted to fit comfortably underneath any jacket I own and it was kind of bordering the like like maybe too bulky like way of resting inside of my garments so I was like you know what if I can just remove like an inch of width I will so I think I only did the increase for the balloon stitches like 10 or 11 times and then I worked straight for like a short while and then with my arms down at my sides because of course like the balloon sleeve shape hasn't been pulled in yet when I had worked like all the increases and the balloon sleeve is at its widest point when my arms down at my sides that met like the edge of my wrist that's when I switched to work the ribbing. And then the instructions have you knit the ribbing for six inches. I knit the ribbing for about three. I could have knit the sleeves for six inches and I would have nice long sleeves. I still might one day. I don't know that I hate the length of the sleeves here, but I do know that I really like a bracelet length because I never have to pull my sleeves back when I'm wearing my shorter sleeve sweaters. Um, they're just always in the right place and I never have to like push them up and adjust them. So there's that. I will say of all the fancy sleeve sweaters, I think the balloon sleeve is my absolute favorite. It gives a little bit of drama, but it's still like very wearable. My first variation of the Ducat sweater by Kate Davies, I knit with a bell sleeve because I wanted to make it my own. And this one I knit, without any shaping also, but the finishing is different. Instead of doing any decreasing or anything at all, I just simply did one by one rib and cast off. And if you don't add any shaping to a sleeve, you're gonna get a bell sleeve, which is fun. But I will say this is one of the least wearable garments that I own, not because it's see-through and it's like a summertime sweater, but because the sleeves, and they are a little bit long, I will say the sleeves are a bit long, but they're just not functional, like in the kitchen. I've almost burned, I actually, you can see a tiny little stain on the cuff where I burned my mohair on the stove because you can't push the sleeves up and they won't stay, you know what I mean? Like they just don't stay. Um, so I'm probably, you know, I'm, I think it's gonna be balloon sleeves for life over here, either balloon sleeves or standard sleeves. I love the bell shaped sleeve. I think it's great too for like a more structured yarn like this yarn has the gauge that I knit this yarn in the fabric is very loose and very drapey and the combination of drape and um, that bell shape is lovely to wear but it's not as I, I like I just can't do anything in this sweater except you know basic things like I just can't clean I can't garden I can't cook it's one of those type types of moments and I, life is too short to not be cleaning or cooking <laughs> or gardening so um you know I do everything in everything I own I, I can't have like a wardrobe just for this or that I really just I don't like limitations put on me and what I can do anyway I've worked a lot of top-down sweaters. Um, if you check out my Ravelry projects page, you'll see pretty much everything I've ever made. I haven't been as good lately at posting photos of my current and um, recent projects. I need to fix that. But um, of all the top-down sweaters I've knit, this was the first time I had ever worked shaping for the neck where I started out knitting flat and increasing at both ends um, on the right side. And then, you know, you're working flat, you're going back and forth, and then you cast on stitches to then join in the round. And for me, that felt like total magic. And I thought it was just absolutely brilliant. And I knew that I wanted to do it again. And I had a lot of anxiety because I didn't want to like, rip off Kate Davies design. I thought like, because this was my only exposure to this. It was all that I, it was the only source that I knew this technique from, but I knew I wanted to do it in one of my own designs one day. I didn't want to be a Kate Davies imposter. 
But um, I was pleasantly surprised while cracking open Barbara Walker's Knitting from the Top. In one of the very first sweater designs, she talks about working from the top down. Um, basic design number one, the raglan pullover, she describes the exact same technique. And honestly, I felt like this book is just a gift from the gods because she spells out in paragraph after paragraph exactly how to construct a sweater like this one. And so one thing that I gained from reading her book is that she says to start, measure the back of your neck. And one of my brilliant viewers out there, I cannot recall your name, I'm so sorry, but you talked in detail about being an expert fashion wear designer to some degree or another and how measuring the back neck and having that be wider than the front is one of the most important elements to proper neck shaping. And I'll never forget you taking the time to explain that and, and just learning in that moment here on YouTube, the same thing that Barbara Walker is saying here in her book. She says, average measurements are for a child, nine to 14 years, four and a half to five inches, for women, five and a half to six inches, for a man, six and a half to seven inches. Then she goes on to say, take one third of the back neck stitches and add this many to each side for the tops of the sleeves. To that total, you add a few more stitches for um, the seams of the corners and then two stitches for the front stitches. And then you're basically working increases at both sides of the seams and on the right side of the front stitches at the corners of the well, corners at the edges of your work flat and then you know as that shaping continues then you might cast on a number of stitches to join in the round this project i'm working on right now is a cardigan so i'm not joining it in the round i have decided to work it flat in entirety which i mean purling is like not everyone's favorite i get it like we all love to just mindlessly knit like i think this the point is for the work to be mindless not so much whether it's knitting or purling. I am using this sweet little basket to store it in. And I've shown this yarn to you in the recent past. It is Jill Draper Makes Stuff Kingston yarn. This yarn has a high twist to the singles from what I can tell. I wonder if I can get a close up for you. If I untwist the singles for you to kind of take out the ply there's three very clearly defined plies to it. And just the fact that I can separate these three plies as effortlessly as I can here without damaging the yarn, I think that that really shows you how much structure these singles have. And the fact that I can pretty much just push it back together and it's maintaining relatively the same shape. I mean, I did disturb the plies somewhat there. It doesn't look perfect any longer, um, but it's, you know, it's not broken. <laughs> it's very much intact um, with no less structure. I think that speaks to how much structure the singles have, which means that there's not a lot of air and it has probably more wool you know, within it, um, it's more dense. I wouldn't compare it to a DK. I, I would just say like, it's probably more similar to a worsted weight yarn, to be honest. I'm gonna throw this over my shoulders to give you a sense of the front shaping of this cardigan. So here we have it, more or less, the front, is going to join kind of right at the bust there and then it'll be worked down until we join the front and the back and then the sleeves will be worked down. I thought it would be best if I kept it with a simple four stitch cable and I just really love a two by two cross. There's, I mean, it's like classic and yeah, it kind of reminds me of like that rope jewelry like that those like gold chains that are like rope and it has this very sweet and simple cable motif um, the two cables on each side turn in towards the sleeve 
so they're mirrored and it's just easy peasy light and breezy i really wanted to work a simple stockinette fabric with this yarn because it is so special and it's flecked with little bits of white and yellow and red and blue it's this gorgeous mauve color it's a very neutral kind of warm brownish grayish type of color i mean there's nothing like it that i've ever seen um, this is the fair street color and i bought this yarn from brooklyn general now that i have the same number of stitches across the front as i do the back i'm just increasing at the corners finally so i have all of the numbers in place for every size up until the point i'm at right now and I'm just knitting until I split for the front and back. So I'm really excited to continue working on this. I really do hope to have the body finished by next week. I think that that's possible because it does knit quite fast. I don't normally knit such a heavy gauge yarn, so it is a little rough on my wrists. I will say if I knit for too long, I get a little bit of a carpal tunnel moment, but worth it. I feel like I put so much energy into creating my YouTube content that I forget Instagram is there to also share with you guys. So I need to put some of my more recent makes up on Instagram more so that they have pictures in my Ravelry projects because I've neglected that tremendously the last year or so. I wish I didn't have to work full time so that I could just create knitting content all day that would be nice but you know I have to pay my bills and um, making garments is my number one passion and just sharing that process with you and talking about knitting is another passion of mine I feel like y'all are my friends out here and I, I hear from you guys as much as I do most people I know in real life because <laughs> we've been consistent here on this platform, Star Baby and I. So I'm really glad that you're joining us today. This is going to be it for today's episode of the Thread to Men podcast. I want to thank you so much for watching. If um, you want to find me on social media, my name is Taylor E. Owen on Ravelry, Instagram, and Twitter. You can find me on TikTok as Taylor Knits. And um, I'm just going to insert a little footage of my garden this week because um, who knows? It might change by next week. I don't, I'm looking at the weather every day. Uh, we're deciding to plant one week and then we move it up to the next week. I don't know, maybe I'm ahead of myself by a week, but I took a little video of the garden as it is and talked about some plants. So I'll just throw that in at the end of this video for you guys. Maybe I'll put some music over it. I don't know, but I hope you have a great day and that you take care. Today is April 2nd and this is a brief garden update. I put my nasturtiums back outside. I bought a couple strawberry plants and I'm waiting to put my tomato out in a couple weeks collard greens are doing well. I think I could probably harvest some of them. Um, I have raspberries coming up in areas that I will likely relocate to the designated raspberry bed. I retied them up better this year than previous years and I've kind of cleared a little space in front of them hoping I can fit more flowers in the garden. Our Alberta peach tree is in full bloom. We covered that over the frost, trying to save these blooms so that we'll get some fruit this year, I hope. Never planted a peach tree before, so I don't know what to expect, but I have a lonesome naked lady bulb that I forgot was put in the ground over here. I wonder if that will flower, I'm not sure. But these are the perennial Black Eyed Susans. Um, that all came from this one plant on the left and then they self-sewed all over and then I accumulated them into one spot here, which is just sort of temporary. Um, I don't know, I would like to have a more planned sort of garden. The blueberry bushes, you can barely see them against the mulch, but I have two blueberry plants here and a sage and I just bought this $10 climbing rose from Lowe's. So I'm optimistic that it'll grow up this trellis. The oregano is coming back right here in front of our pawpaw tree. Calendula, 
planted in front of some daffodils in front of the St. John's Wort bush that I hacked back at the lower and front sides. I kind of kept the height because I didn't know what I was doing and I thought I probably won't kill it if I leave something left. So it was an experiment in pruning. Our second pawpaw tree and the black raspberries, which are fruiting a lot on one side and not as much fruiting. I meant to say leafing out. Forsythia is in full bloom. It brings a lot of joy. And then this is our fig tree. And we have a third pawpaw tree right here and more oregano. This is coarse radish, which is impossible to eradicate. I have my containers planted. We have nasturtiums, collard greens. Those are some chives. And in this container we have lemon balm. That's my cat hutch for the ferals to be sheltered in the rain. We have some collard greens. They look like they need a little water. We have peppermint here and lemon balm. Well, oh, thanks for joining me in my garden tour of April 2022.